Um, I'm Professor Becky Francis. I'm Director of the Institute of Education, the IOE as you know it. And welcome to the very first of our debates in our series titled, What If? Radical and Inspiring Ideas for Alternative Education Futures. It's one of my priorities to make the IOE a hub for debate on global education issues. And to that end, we've put in place this event series to challenge a range of high-profile speakers to bring some fresh thinking to key global debates in education. And I'm pleased to say that the TES has come on board. Thank you, Ed. Um, with the series, which, of course, will broaden its reach even further. Many out there will be live streaming this event and the debate will be available as a podcast for you to use with colleagues and your students. And this first event is particularly close to my own heart because my research is very much engaged with social equality and social justice in education. Now, the topic of social mobility appears ever more debated but there's risk of a lot of talk and wringing of hands, um, but little radical thinking, we might argue, to address the really stark problem of social immobility. A couple of months ago, I was privileged to be a panellist at the Sutton Trust Summit on Social Mobility. And as you know, the Sutton Trust have been long-standing pioneers on this issue in relation to education. And true to form, that summit was extremely high quality. But notably, while professors Steve Machin, Anna Vig Knowles, and John Goldthorpe debated the existence of or otherwise of minimal mobility on the margins, there was general agreement on their conclusive point that, in spite of the, the exceptions that we know about, the education system doesn't promote social mobility and schools don't compensate for society. Begging the question, given the scale of the problem and the limited uh, fiscal climate and the constraints there, does the volume of political noise about social mobility and education even provide a smokescreen for a lack of commitment to social and institutional change that would be necessary to facilitate it? Ought we to be looking at more radical solutions? And if so, is this about stripping out the burgeoning means by which financial, social, and cultural capital ensures access to elite paths. I'm thinking there maybe of um, internships, if you like, or um, the uh, UCAS applications, personal statements, and so forth. Or is it by taking more radical means to narrow gaps? What role, if any, does education have to play in this? So I'm really looking forward to our panellists' views on this issue. A couple of housekeeping matters first. For those of you who like to tweet, you'll find the Wi-Fi login instructions on your seats. Those watching via the live stream can submit questions to the panel via the hashtag IOEDebates. And we're not expecting a fire drill. So if the alarm sounds, do pl please take the doors behind you, turn right, and our fire marshals will guide you out to Bedford Way, or if necessary, down a floor so that you can exit out of the back of the building. And now to introduce our esteemed speakers. Kate Pickett is Professor of Epidemiology at the University of York and co-author of the best-selling and much-awarded book, The Spirit Level, Why Equality is Better for Everyone, which has been translated into over 20 different languages and inspired the 2015 documentary film, The Divide. Kate's also co-founder and trustee of the Equality Trust, which promotes evidence-based arguments on reducing economic inequality and improving quality of life in the UK. And we were just hearing you have a new report and a book coming out in the summer. So do look that up. Uh, the book, I think I'm right to say, builds on the spirit level. So, yeah, a top up. And the Right Honourable Lord David Willits, the end here, is Executive Chair of the Resolution Foundation and former MP for Havant and Minister for Universities and Science, 2010 to 14. Prior to that, he worked at the Treasury and the Number 10 Policy Unit. David's written widely on economic and social policy, and his book, The Pinch, was widely acclaimed. 
He's just completed a book on the importance of universities, a university education, which will be published next month. So look out for that one too. And Diane Ray is Emeritus Professor of Education at Cambridge University and Visiting Professor at LSE. And she's a very well-known sociologist of education. She's researched social inequality in primary, secondary, and post-compulsory stages of education, exploring intersections of social class, gender, and ethnicity in educational contexts. And this month, Diane published Miseducation, Inequality, Education, and the Working Classes. i can show you the front piece. <laughs> Uh, with one reviewer stating that the book should be mandatory reading for anyone proclaiming greater equity in education. And as of this month, James Croft is editor at Education Investment magazine, which bills itself as the leading source of business intelligence for the international education investment community. Congratulations, James. Thank you. Um, prior to that, he was founder and chair of the Centre for Education Economics, a think tank working to improve education reform. A regular commentator on education policy, James has authored a number of provocative reports for the CFEE, never afraid to question and challenge what for others might have become taken for granted assumptions. And the most recent of those was Optimising Autonomy, a Blueprint for Education Reform. So I think you can see from those biographies that we have a genuine range of views on the panel, and I hope that that will generate stimulating and radical debate. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to the speakers. Each will speak for a maximum of 10 minutes so that we've got plenty of time for discussion. And we're starting with Kate. Over to you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice introduction, Becky. Although really in the context of this evening's debate being introduced in terms of, of the high esteem in which we're held and the awards which we've been given is problematic in itself. Um, and I will correct one thing. The title of our book is Equality is Better for Almost Everyone. Not everyone. And of course, the almost exception is most likely to want to block radical reform that might change the way our society is. So it is an important distinction I've been struck over the last few years by the number of studies that keep showing us that inequality of opportunity cannot be divorced from inequality of outcome. The most unequal societies have the lowest social mobility. So if you want to live the American dream, you need to go to Denmark because that's where you're most likely to achieve it. The correlation between low social mobility and high economic inequality is very, very close. And we believe it is a causal relationship. And the social gradients in attainment that we see within every society, that those at the bottom of society do less well in terms of their educational achievement, is something that is created by that socioeconomic inequality. It's not to do with God-given differences in people's talent or abilities. It's shaped by the structure of our societies. Sorry, should I shout a little louder? Nobel Prize winning economist Jim Heckman has drawn our attention to the very, very different um, environments in which children grow up that either inculcate them to do well educationally or not. He, he points to the difference in the number of words that children from working class backgrounds hear um, in their first few years um, and the ways in which parents prime children to start to do well or not do well, set them on different trajectories from a really, really early age. And we know from our own data in the UK that mm. Children are set on an educational trajectory from before they go to school. And even if they're doing quite well before they go to school, school can reduce their possibilities of doing well if they come from a working class background. Now, the reason why families are unable to pay attention necessarily to optimizing their children's ability to achieve in the terms that we think are good are because of the other effects of inequality. More parents have 
suffer from mental illness, depression and anxiety, they have more debt, they work longer hours, whatever they want for their children, whatever they wish to achieve for them, they're hampered in their ability to put time and resources into it by the effects of inequality itself. And our education system really has an impact as well. There's a thing called the Pygmalion effect. And this is that if children's work is marked by graders who do not know the social class or the ethnicity of the children they are marking, they are given higher marks than if they are marked by their own teachers. Now this shows us that teachers reflect the inequality of society. They are products of the society they live in. It's, it's not a conscious bias, I'm sure. I think most teachers are really trying to do the best they can for their pupils, but they are shaped by the inequalities of the society they live in, and they judge students from different backgrounds differently. I have a fundamental problem with the question of this debate as a whole. Do we want social mobility? We've been asked, you know, what do we mean by it? What can education do to create it? I would question the very premise that we actually want social mobility in the terms that it is normally understood. Why do we want everybody to climb that social ladder when our society actually needs a variety and diversity of contributions that should be equally valued? We reify particular intellectual skills and we value them accordingly and we pay them very highly. I'm one of three sisters. I'm a professor, I have a sister who's a planner, I have a sister who's a playground assistant. Imagine the difference in our incomes and ask yourselves, who contributes the most to society? I would suggest that it is my sister who is paid the minimum wage. However, we have been asked to propose radical ideas about what we can do with the education system to address these issues of inequality. So I will suggest a few in my 10 minutes. Um, I have been quite interested recently in the narcissistic personality inventory because of a book we're writing. You should all try it for yourselves. You get to answer paired questions about various things. And one of them is, um, do you think the world would be a better place if you were in charge? And I'm afraid I think would be, if I were, because I'm going to suggest a few <laughs> radical things which um, will reveal to you why I will never be elected to any political office, but this is what I would do. I would ban all private education. I would outlaw private education entirely because of the way it perpetuates the intergenerational inequality that we have in this country to such extremes. I would randomise allocation to secondary schools and primary schools within localities, and I would obviously get rid of student tuition fees. I also think most primary school children enjoy their schools and suffer a real transition when they go to secondary school, where if you are from a stigmatised minority, your feelings about that become much, much more heightened because you're in a much bigger environment. We put secondary school pupils into large schools because we think they need to be taught specialist subjects by specialist teachers. So why not have the teachers travel to the local schools and keep school size smaller? Our curricula should be child development based and it should be evidence based and it is neither of those things at the moment. We should train our teachers to reflect on the society they live in and the ways in which that shapes their relationship with their pupils. And as an epidemiologist, most of my work involves comparative analysis of, of different countries and looking to see how, how different places do in terms of health and well-being. And this is a really good lens through which to think about our education system because there are other countries that do so much better than we do. They do better in terms of child well-being, they do better in educational attainment, they do better in closing the gap in educational attainment between those at the bottom of society and those at the top, so we need to look to those and learn. Finland is a shining example of a country that had a look at itself 
and said, we're pretty crap at education, we're not doing very well, let's do better. National conversation, they moved to a completely comprehensive, non-selective system, they started to pay their teachers more, they talked about the value of education, they shot up the international rankings, and they are at the top for Western Europe and have stayed there ever since they did that. More recently, Sweden did the opposite and decided to introduce free schools, a model that we have decided to copy. In 2015, the OECD published the most damning report I have ever seen them publish. I've never seen them take such a stance on anything before. They basically published a report on the Swedish educational system and said, stop. Stop what you're doing. Stop the free school nonsense. Stop this idea that if parents can choose, everything will be better and go back to what you had before because your child well-being is suffering, your educational attainment is suffering. So we can look to other countries. We can look to other educational models. We can pick the things that work. We just keep on picking the wrong ones. But I will finish by saying, unless we address the social and economic inequality in this country that is the root cause of the educational inequalities we see, we will never achieve the level playing field for our children that we want. We cannot expect our educational system to fix the social ills that so are deeply embedded in the way we structure our society. I hope I haven't gone over 10. Spot on. Thank Spot you on. very much, Kate. That was great. Um, I must just clarify, just in case we have uh, oh, God, teachers. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And you were on the money. Uh, colleagues from free schools in the audience, that they are, of course, very different to those in Sweden in terms of the model. Um, but a really good question about the sort of role of the state and autonomy there as well. James. Okay. 10 minutes. Uh, so, um, yes, I, I, um, uh, and the brief that I was given for this event quite tricky um, because it said, uh, um, you know, working on social mobility is hard and uh, we've been doing it for, for uh, several decades. Um, is there a quicker way? What's your idea for a quicker fix? Um, <clears throat> uh, as advocates of... Um, of uh, system design and, um, and, and careful attention to the way in which different aspects of the system uh, work uh, together for good or ill, um, uh, uh, cross purposes or, or uh, within alignment, um, uh, I'm going to disappoint you um, if you're looking for a quick fix. Um, the role of education uh, in promoting social mobility is, of course, a matter of intense contemporary sociological and political debate. Um, in modern societies, education, specifically the, access, um, the acquisition of higher uh, education qualifications, uh, which has uh, tended to be a key measure for, uh, for social mobility, has become uh, an increasingly important factor in determining which jobs people enter and their social class position. Government policy and educational institutions, uh, admissions and certification practices have a significant impact on social inequalities. Uh, so what do we know and what can the government learn about what policies and practices can make a difference? Well, first, funding. Uh, evidence from international cross-sections uh, and across US states suggests that social mobility is going to be higher when public education is better funded. Uh, historically, of course, economic research has tended to focus on the relationship to educational outcomes, uh, yielding a somewhat mixed picture, um, though methodological improvements have shown positive results for long-term outcomes. A notable recent study of US reforms has recently found, however, that a 10% increase in per-pupil spending each year, all 12 years of public school, uh, leads to... 0.27% uh, of completed years of education, 7.25% uh, of higher wages, and 3.67% reduction in the annual in incidence of adult poverty. Uh, 
Importantly, the, the research has found that effects are much more pronounced for low-income families. Uh, likewise, similar research in the UK has shown that a £400 increase in primary school funding per year, just over 10%, can improve key stage 2 test scores by about 10% of a standard deviation, which with considerably larger effects uh, for schools serving poorer families. So money matters, and it matters more for disadvantaged peoples. Second, selection practices. A number of studies have found selection has clear adverse effects for equity in terms of both academic achievement and long-term labour market outcomes, uh, measured as the impact of family background on these outcomes. Uh, so far, so, in so far, so much in agreement. Um, at system level, we know that uh, from the Chilean ex uh, experiment uh, with that selection, uh, that when it's combined with a laissez-faire attitude to top-ups, has a similar excluding effect as private tuition, uh, or private tutoring for grammar school entry. In Chile, these policies resulted in mobility from poorly performing schools to better schools becoming restricted to well-performing pupils from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, moreover, pupils attending low-quality schools that potentially faced school closure ended up with no viable alternative schools, partly because selection practices had effectively barred them from attending local schools. Finally, there's the added problem that selection distorts mechanisms aimed at increasing choice and competition. Third, in respect of choice and information provision, we know that parents of less privileged backgrounds make fewer ambitious choices and their children are less likely to get into good schools than more advantaged pupils. But we also know that parents respond to information about education quality to positive effects for test score outcomes, um, but accurate, credible and sufficiently intelligible information on school quality is lacking and that choice and competition are positive for pupil outcomes. Uh, we've done a number of surveys of the economic literature on this. In contrast to increasing selection, increasing choice and decoupling it crucially from proximity probably reduces between school differences, uh, that is segregation, and certainly has no overall adverse effects on achievement differences between pupils, and may even benefit pupils uh, of lower educated families and lower socioeconomic background, more than pupils of others. Now on the former uh, segregation, although those studies appear to indicate the con uh, to the contrary, the education research does not account for the counterfactual importance of residential segregation and enrollment in private schools for school segregation, i.e. School, ch school choices that would have been made regardless of whether there are any institutional school choice programs in place. The key is to get rid of proximity as the basis for admissions. Such approaches lend an advantage to those wealthy enough to buy their way into, sc into the school catchment area. Far from ensuring parents' rights to a place at the local school, in practice, over time, Proximity principle does exactly the reverse, as good and improving schools drive up property prices, the neighbourhood gentrifies, and rents increase. The resulting residential segregation exercises a highly determinative influence on school outcomes. In that lotteries, in cases of oversubscription, work with choice to break the tie to residents, these are greatly to be preferred in admissions. Lotteries are often feared because of the perception that they would thwart parent choice, result in longer school commutes, and might disrupt anticipated peer effects. To ensure that the choice mechanism is not undermined, lotteries should not be allowed at the local authority level, in my view, or across districts, but only in cases of oversubscription, in that parents would continue to take account for travel time in their preferences, and only a minority would be likely to choose primary schools far away from their homes precisely because they value distance to school, serious displacement would, in my view, be minimal and would be mitigated in any case by the introduction of maximum drive times on welfare grounds. Of course, to overcome geography, you also need to incentivize supply to socioeconomically challenged areas. Think 
Pupil Premium Plus Plus. And you also need to add supporting measures such as investment in developing the school transportation network. As to peer effects, economic research indicates that the socioeconomic background of a child's peer group is not half as important as supposed. Peer effects are much more complex than generally imagined, working both positively and negatively depending on pupils' individual profiles and motivations. All of this said, of course, input-based measures and efforts to engineer the system via improving access to quality schooling can only take us so far. Some of the mechanisms I highlight work better than others, but social mobility is ultimately about improving attainment, imparting knowledge and skills for the workplace, and certifying what pupils have achieved, which are closely allied to questions of curriculum choice and teaching method. In terms of certification, our system now prioritises recognition of attainment in knowledge-intensive subjects believed to have the greatest economic value, largely by virtue of their being harder to do well in. Differentiation may improve at the top end as a result of this, but the price for middle and low attainers is not yet clear. Ofsted's comparable outcomes introduced to alleviate the inevitable disruption caused uh, <clears throat> to maintaining standards does not have much given it, even with the addition of the national reference test, and at any rate doesn't change anything for the many, many students who find themselves unable uh, to attain in these subjects and are faced with having to find other options than the academic post-16. So how are we to capture young people's human capital value? 30 seconds left. Well, I begin to feel that changing our approach to general certification would be a good place to start. This would involve, one, resetting the national curriculum requirement to a minimum standard, two, thereby allowing space for genuine breadth and balance in the curriculum, and so for the non-examined curriculum and extracurricular learning, three, introducing a US-style secondary school basic certification or diploma, certifying functional skills and core curriculum competency to be conferred on the institutional authority with appropriate safeguards. And four, an approach to inspection based on robust professional dialogue about curriculum quality on the basis of what we know from evidence. With the retention of standardized testing at 11 and its introduction at 16 for accountability purposes, taking that pressure off the GCSEs, their uptake and that of a range of other qualifications that, ha that would be given r room uh, on this model might be determined more straightforwardly by student interests in progression and demonstrating specialism. Students would in general probably take fewer of them with a core of key subjects leaving wider scope for exploration of different subjects and pathways in the years preceding assessment and exams year and for the choice of demonstrating some early specialism too, to take further or not at A-level. As things stand, present accountability and certification arrangements are not helping us with efforts to develop our human capital. There is considerable scope to do it better if we recognise that teaching quality and student learning need to be assessed in diverse ways and not with reference to student test scores alone. Thank you very much, James and Diane. If you really want to further social mobility through education, we'd be making a long-standing, much-repeated mistake. It's not just the wrong objective, it's looking in the wrong area. <clears throat> High social mobility between 1945 and the 1970s was due to Labour governments investing in public sector employment, not because of education policies. The question buys into the widespread myth that the main barriers to social mobility lie in a lack of aspiration and insufficient work among the working classes and inadequate teaching in state schools. The actual causes of low social mobility lie elsewhere, in wider systemic inequalities, neoliberal hegemony and the workings of free market capitalism. As a coal miner's daughter who was a free school meal pupil throughout her schooling and became a Cambridge professor, I can say with certainty that social mobility is a flawed solution to social ills and educational inequalities. Moving a few of us working classes into the middle and upper classes is primarily a means of recycling class inequality rather than reducing it. 
And that should be the focus. The vast social and economic inequalities in UK society. Currently, we have an oligarchy of the wealthy and the economically powerful. In order to have a social de democracy that's fairer both economically and in terms of the distribution of power, we need to radically change social structures, not just the social class of a few individuals. The emphasis has always been on moving a small number of working class people, high achievers, merely converting into doctors, barristers and professors, a small number of working class people who would otherwise remain in manual work. Instead, we need to concentrate our resources and energy on supporting and valuing the much larger group of working class students and young people who are left behind to provide an excellent, well-rounded education for all children, regardless of gender, race and class. I use R.H. Tawney a lot in my work. He wrote, social well-being depends upon cohesion and solidarity. It implies the existence not merely of opportunities to ascend, but of a high level of general culture and a strong sense of common interests. And a diffusion throughout society of a conviction that civilization is not the business of an elite alone, but a common enterprise which is the concern of all. And individual happiness does not only require that individuals are free to rise to new positions and comfort and distinction, it also requires that they should be able to lead a life of dignity and culture, whether they rise or not. In our austere post-Brexit neoliberal times, a strong sense of common interests and the conviction that society is not the business of an elite alone has largely disappeared. Consequently, any vision of a fair and just society needs to be much bolder and brighter than one that sees social mobility as the solution. As Tawney argued, education should also be seen as an end in itself, a space that people seek out, not that they may become something else, but because they are what they are. Making it a vehicle of neoliberal aspiration with a central aim of facilitating social mobility diminishes education, making it work for the select few and not the many. In the book I've just written, I argue for something that's never been seriously attempted, let alone achieved within English education, namely social justice for the working classes. Instead of more neoliberal policies that focus on social mobility, state school classrooms should be transformed from the task-driven, target-led, overly competitive environments they are currently. Environments that are damaging and impact negatively on all children, particularly the large number of working class children who then become positioned as educational failures. A revalorizing of vocational and working class knowledges, a broadening out of what constitutes educational success beyond the narrowly academic is long overdue. We need an educational system that accords respect to the working classes and realises working class children's potential. In almost 150 years of state education, the educational system has signally failed to achieve this. In Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paolo Ferreri writes of education as having one of two functions, either an instrument of conformity, socialising younger generations into neoliberal capitalism, or else operating as the practice of freedom, enabling children and young people to engage critically and reflexively with the society they are part of, and to learn how to participate in transforming it for the better. This would necessitate very different relationships between schools and working class communities, relationships that reconnect education to democracy and schools to their communities. So we need to start seeing social mobility in collective, not individualistic terms. It's about raising the status, value, income and economic security of all those who are working class and not just a few select individuals. In 21st century England, there have been myriad educational policies that focus on raising aspiration and increasing social mobility but none that adequately resource working class academic achievement. 
and a growing number such as setting, streaming, assessive testing and assessment, and the intense focus on competition that work against working class educational success. Social mobility is a cheap policy option in comparison to funding the English educational system so that it can support and nurture working class educational success. It places the onus for change on the working class individual and not a steeply hierarchical and unfair educational system. Under social mobility initiatives, the working classes are expected to succeed against slightly reduced odds and transform into acceptably middle-class versions of themselves. The more the focus is on social mobility, the less the educational system and society will have to change. Social mobility has become a means of validating and propping up the status quo, an outdated policy for tired neoliberal times. It's time to move on and implement policies that really are bold and brave and as well as being socially just. And education would, of course, play a part in this through policies that prioritise collaboration, mixed schools, mixed classrooms, collegial rather than competitive ways of working, and ensuring that all children, regardless of social class, receive the same resources and standards, are encouraged to question and think critically. We need to replace the existing separate educational strands for the upper, middle and working classes with socially just education for all, in which learning dispositions of confidence, entitlement, cooperation, curiosity, creativity and reflexivity are seen to be the right of all children. But achieving a fairer society in which social mobility occurs with relative ease in both directions requires much more than that. It requires root and branch redistribution, and to echo Kate, the abolition of the private schools, workers' rights. As I said at the beginning of my talk, a much more equal social democracy, rather than the oligarchy based on the wealth and power of a tiny elite that we suffer now. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And David. Well, this is going to be a lively debate, I think. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you very much for the opportunity to join in. Um, and I think what you've done, Becky, is set, up a, set us a very good challenge. Because your question, what if we really wanted to further social mobility through education, reminds us of the fact that, contrary to the complacent assumption, education does not of itself and automatically boost social mobility. And that's what I want to touch on in both of my remarks. But I should just comment on what Diane said. Um, and I understand, I, mean, I understand the point that Diane is making. And indeed, if you look at the, um, at the sort of debate prompted, uh, you know, 60 years ago by the Michael Young rise of meritocracy, and of course that itself was a concept about which he was very ambivalent, you'll actually find, I think, one of the most humane reactions in Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, which he wrote a couple of years afterwards, where he went out of his way to say market returns in which a pop singer earns more than a doctor who earns more than a nurse and not moral judgments on people's relative worth and a society where market returns equaled all other rewards to status and were taken as some kind of judgment of moral worth would, would be one that he would find deeply unpalatable. So I understand at least some of what you're trying to say, but I have to say, I think it would, taking it to the position you reach, you almost get a strange kind of alliance of the far left and the far right who don't want to change anything. Um, because it can become, it could be, get quite close to saying people should stay where they are and they shouldn't have the opportunity of moving on to something different. And let's face it, setting aside one's exact views about the political system, part of the deal in a, in a modern society is that, by and large, we want round pegs in round holes. I don't want to feel, when I go to the doctor, that there were fantastically good doctors, potential doctors out there, 
But because of their background, they never had the opportunity of becoming a doctor. I don't want to live in a society of mute, inglorious Miltons, where people who could do something, including fulfilled professional ambitions, are not able to do so. And that seems to me to be the, core, the kernel of the proposition of social mobility, which is why it is such an important idea in modern societies. Otherwise, setting aside whether it's wrong, social mobility is wrong, it's clearly wasteful. It is clearly not the basis on which we would like our society to work. I want the people who are most suited to the individual and wide range of activities in modern society to have the opportunity of doing them. Uh, if I turn to the exam question, I had four observations on what we could do about harnessing education to further social mobility. The first has been very well covered both by uh, Kate and by James, which is the this frustrating paradox that good schools don't necessarily boost social mobility, and you may just find as they operate in a wider economy that house prices around the schools with high levels of academic attainment just go up. Uh, and I personally have a lot of sympathy with the lottery solution, which interestingly has come up twice already this evening. So I, I don't think I need to go further down that route. Let me touch on three other things that we could look at. Um, there is, first of all, the fraught issue of access to higher education. And again, what worried me a bit about what Diane said is that in modern economies, higher education is a fantastic opportunity for people and is a transformational experience. And I think transformational in a good sense. I was not totally sure whether Diane wanted education to transform people at all. Higher education does transform people. And by and large, in ways that I think most of us regard as benign. Uh, that doesn't mean it just boosts their earnings. It also means it makes them, free. by and large, people when they emerge from higher education, for example, seem to show high levels of uh, interest in, uh, high levels of, to of social tolerance, for example, high levels of part political participation. So giving everybody the opportunity of getting into university who could possibly benefit from it is very important. Um, it is not, getting into university should not simply be a reward for good A-levels. And universities absolutely need to take account of people's future potential, not just their prior achievement. Uh, it would be great if the newspapers that rank universities didn't just automatically rank them by the prior attainment of the people that they are recruiting. There are a lot of universities that are take, faced with very fraught and highly charged decisions because they would like to recruit people with lower A-level grades on the basis of what they could benefit from going to that university and what they could contribute, but knows that on, on quite a few of the rankings, that will pull them down. Indeed, some of the very newspapers that write leader articles about the importance of social mobility and opportunity then run ranking systems, which are clearly a barrier to it. Uh, the other thing which we are doing at King's College, where I'm a visiting professor, is an interesting example. I don't know whether Diane, I'm not totally sure now whether Diane would approve it or not approve it. But King's includes uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's. And Cyril Chandler, who was the head of the medical school at the time, uh, was going around schools in South London, saying to the kids in those comprehensives, it'll be great when some of you are consultants and doctors in Guy's and St. Thomas's. One of the head teachers took him aside and said, none of the kids at our school get the three grade A's at A level, which you need in order to get to medical school. So they're not going to be going to medical school. And that led to King's creating an extra route in to the medical schools that serve Guy's and St. Thomas's, where they took kids with radically lower A level grades they provided an extra year of higher education to, br uh, to bring them up to the level of understanding of the biology or the physiology of whatever you needed in order, to, in order to get a medical qualification. And what's interesting is at the end of the day, although that group had a slightly higher failure rate, not all of them became uh, medical consultants, and there comes a point when sheer capacity to do something does matter. You don't want to be wheeled into surgery and be told, I'm terribly sorry, it's not a very good surgeon, but they came from a tough background, we've got to give them a chance. There comes a point when actual ability to do it does matter. What they found is that the success rate, and moving into 
the medical profession was almost as high as those kids with far lower A-level grades than the ones can, recruited in the conventional route. And that kind of initiative should be more widespread and does involve, incidentally, an extra year of higher education. Now, Kate, in passing, said we should obviously get rid of fees. We could have the whole evening on getting rid of fees. But let me just say, if you get rid of fees and you finance higher education in another way, you'll be lucky if it's as progressive as financing higher education by the more affluent graduates paying for its cost. Most of the alternatives are regressive compared to that. And also, one of the prizes that you get from taking higher education out of public spending is you get rid of number controls. And the removal of number controls is one of the crucial factors in broadening access to higher education because the kids that miss out when you have any kind of rationing system are the ones from more disadvantaged backgrounds. That's why more kids from disadvantaged backgrounds go to university in England than in Scotland. Uh, and, uh, of course, the evidence is, thank heavens, and if the evidence was different, I wouldn't have advocated this, but if the evidence both from the Blair reforms and what I was involved in is that they, during that time, the proportion of kids from disadvantaged backgrounds going to university has doubled. It's still too low, but it's gone from 10% of the, of the kids in the poorest community going to university to 20%. There are two other areas of policy I should briefly refer to. Um, what we now know from the evidence is although there has been progress in England in getting kids from disadvantaged background into university, even if they then achieve a given level of educational qualification, for any given level of higher education that they achieve, their labour market rewards are lower than from, people, from the students of more advantaged backgrounds. And that has led to a shift in thinking. In my time, we focused very much the access spend on trying to get the kids from the disadvantaged backgrounds into university. Uh, Joe Johnson's legislation has made it easier. When I used to have these conversations with Les Ebden, Les would say to me, the legal framework within which I operate makes it very hard for me to tell universities they should use their access fund on, fund on, spend, on funding internships for kids that couldn't afford to do them otherwise. And in the new legal framework, that kind of spend, universities then to focus on how their students get on into the labour market is now permitted and encouraged. And then finally, and there's only 30 seconds to this, but I do think that the preoccupation with early years has gone too far. And one of the consequences of that, given that whatever regime you imagine, there's only going to be a limited amount of resource that's available, is that we have seen a big reduction in spending on adult education, a big reduction in spending on things like adult literacy and numeracy programs, which are incredibly effective and whose returns are at least as high as those claimed for early years. Uh, we've, and I personally think that if I were trying to boost social mobility, I would not just look at the youngsters starting in the system, I would look at adults who want a second chance and maybe aren't settling for the opportunities that Diane wants to restrict them to. I think of those people I meet at City Lit who maybe, maybe after 10 years, they haven't in, they, 10 or 15 years in employment, they think they're in a dead-end job. Sometimes, interesting, they, they come to the end of a relationship. They want to do something different, and adult education is their chance. Thank you very much, David. Well, I think that's been very <laughs> provocative, so we should do a round of applause. That was a really excellent input, I think, um, and we've had a, a, you know, a good range of views, but really meaty stuff, uh, which is excellent, especially for our first debate. I mean, I was really interested that uh, the early years didn't come through strongly, actually, uh, across the panel, because I would debate with you, I think, David, about the importance there uh, in relation to equalising starting points. Um, we've also, we come back to this challenge again about our system again and again, don't we? Actually, um, compared to many of um, our competitor nations, uh, we have a very comprehensive system of education in, in England, um, but it's very, very diverse in terms of the different schools available, the access to them. And we've had time and again, haven't we, this issue about admissions coming up, which is clearly important. We haven't touched very much on issues about cultural capital. And actually, I was very heartened at the end um, that David introduced the topic of universities and our role in maintaining uh, both inequality and 
immobility potentially and uh, but a really interesting point that David made about the global challenges here you know we are now in our marketized higher education system all playing in terms of global rankings uh, which as David said uh, score on the basis of high student grades for access and so on so we're caught in this really problematic cycle I think we've opened up all sorts of issues um, we know that the long-standing social science says that um, it's actually employment, as, as Diane alluded to, um, and wages um, that, that uh, have most impact here. So that actually, um, as John Goldthorpe says, you know, boosting low wages, um, as Steve Machen says, uh, ending the gig economy and so on are possibly more likely to have a sharper impact in this area than the education system. But nevertheless, we can all think of exemplars, can't we, whether those are schools, multi-academy trusts, local authorities, Camden, where we're sitting at the moment being a key exemplar here, where schools and education are narrowing gaps, are transforming uh, outcomes for working class young people and so on. So we've got this real set of dilemmas, I think, and a very, very complicated picture. Um, what I suggest we do is give each of our panellists 30 seconds to respond, because I know they'll probably all be feeling about what's been said by others, um, and then we'll open it up to you for your questions. So we we'll start again in the same order that we... 30 seconds is a real challenge. Well, make it I a am, minute. Because I am feeling quite cross. Um, That's good. I met David earlier in our green room, and I think he's a lovely person, but... But when he described this, um, but, when he but, described but. us as have it getting into a lively and fun debate, it made me want to cry because actually what we're talking about is a system that scars people um, from, from an early, early age. They're scarred by their limitations if they don't succeed. And if they do succeed in being socially mobile, they're scarred as well. The there's, there's stigma throughout the system, it's not wasteful to not have everybody socially mobile. It's wasteful if we don't make the most of people's capabilities, interests and contributions. We don't need everybody to be doctors. We need some people to be nurses and we need some people to be care assistants and we need some people to make the food and some people to clean the floor and some people to wipe your bum. You know, we need, all of, we need all of that. We need to value all of those contributions in different ways. We need to value vocational things as much as we value intellectual things. And higher education doesn't transform working class pupils, students, in the same way it transforms other people. They end up with more debt, they owe more, and they get less. They are less likely to get the kinds of jobs that middle-class students get when they go through higher education. So, so the system is painfully, painfully inadequate, and I can't think of this as a fun debate. It's much, much too important for that. Thank you. Give me, David. James. Uh, yeah, 30 seconds is enough for me. I'm feeling fairly sanguine, actually. Um, uh, I mean, you know, I think, you know, sort of look back over, um, you know, there have been reports in the last year around social mobility, uh, around improving equity for disadvantaged people and uh, looking at policy success. And they've pretty consistently basically said that we've had very little policy success. Um, and, uh, you know, We've seen efforts over 30 years to try to improve this. Now, um, so I, so I feel that it's actually what we need to be doing is is uh, is is um, working up realistic proposals to actually work with the system that we've got to do the best that we can with it. Um, I want to see an open system. I want to see, by which I mean one in which you can move around in uh, educationally. Uh, with clear pathways that's well organized has good information and guidance um, that's predicated on a range of ways of valuing emerging human capital if you like to use an economic term uh, in young people 
um, that doesn't skew uh, that, that valuation uh, in one direction uh, or another. Um, we have a system that is all built up around accountability metrics that are all entirely based on um, a particular view of curriculum that um, you know, is increasingly clear, uh, it is restrictive. Um, we've built our, our, our curriculum around that, our accountability. We've created a, a, a system of oversight uh, and uh, an accountability publicly um, on that, which is, um, which is on shaky foundation, to be quite honest. So, um, you know, yes, we need to decompress the system, we need to open it up, we need better information and guidance and, um, and better pathways. Um, Thank you, James. Thank you. Okay, two statistics from um, 2017. The um, number of graduates in non-graduate employment is now 59.7% and they are disproportionately young people from working class backgrounds. Um, the Government Longitudinal Educational Outcomes data set shows that five years after graduation, average earning for business graduates from Wolverhampton are getting 19,200. At the University of Oxford, they're getting 17,700. That's a staggering difference of 52,000. Of course, I want everyone to go to university and for free. But what young people are sold, particularly non-traditional young people, is that they will also get a good job. And all the research shows when they talk about what they expect from their university, they expect a good job as well as positive learning experiences. And HE is promising that and it can't deliver it. And it's a cost for working class students of average debts now hitting 59,000 a year. Thank you, Simon. Uh, you're right, this debate is certainly is not fun. It's getting very serious and what is being said is very dangerous. I represented a constituency with a very large council estate and where um, whereas Vince in Twickenham had 62% of his young people going to university. I had in haven't 20% of young people going to university. I'm absolutely clear that for many of those young people, going to university would have been a very good option for them. We're getting some extremely dangerous, sophisticated arguments for the left that young working class kids should not go to university. This is absolutely the wrong advice for them. The clear advice for them is if you look at the structure of a modern economy, the best bet you've got is going to university. Now, I am talking averages, and there are absolutely divergences by what you study and by where you study. But the most powerful single way in which I could boost the opportunities of the people on that council state would have been more of them going to university. Now, of course, I fully accept, and I tried to explain this at the beginning, being a nursing assistant is as morally valuable a job as being a doctor. But setting aside the moral importance of people having the opportunity to go into university, I want, when I go to hospital, that the people who could potentially have been the best doctors have had that opportunity. In, on that estate, there were people who could have been bloody good doctors, and they didn't have that opportunity, and the best route for them was to go to university. And the argument, oh, well, the debt, you know perfectly well, they'll only pay back if they're in well-paid jobs. It's not like an overdraft. It's not like a mortgage. Every time people say, oh, we, we don't, this is, this is conspiring in blocking opportunities for working-class kids. It's not a celebration of working-class culture and the Richard Hoggart uses and abuses of literacy style anymore. It's saying, don't go if you're from a poor work, working-class background, it's not for you. That is wrong and it's dangerous. I, can I just say that I didn't say that? Yeah, well, <laughs> if you yeah, look at the, the figures, free, it's absolutely yeah. clear, it's absolutely clear we need to expand higher education and we need to expand opportunities and many more kids from deprived of backgrounds should go and they should not be put, put off by any financial worries because they'll only pay back if they're in well-paid jobs. That is the unambiguous message that everybody who cares about the quality of life of people from tough backgrounds should surely support. I think, thank you very much. I think that um, to, to, to bring this together slightly, it's been good that we've had lots of radical thinking. Um, there, there's two different issues here, I suspect. Uh, one is about the present sort of fiscal envelope for education and, uh, and, and improving uh, our current system 
within the, or, or broadly within those parameters. And the other, which is implied uh, certainly by Diane and to some extent by what Kate said, is a radical change uh, in the way that we act socially. Um, you, you know, the implications would be of a, a, a completely different taxation system and so on, yeah. I imagine, from what you're saying. So, um, I, I, you know, that is great in terms of the broadness of the, our perspectives and provoking proper radical thinking, which was the, um, the topic for the debate and a good divergence of views. So without further ado, we'd love to hear your questions and I'll take them in uh, groups of three, please. Let's go to do that. So hands, one here, Ed, and one at the back. Perfect. So this gentleman first. Hi, yeah. Um, I kind of agree with David in terms of the a nursing assistant being morally equivalent to a doctor. However, I don't think that is actually what happens in society. And the monetary value that is placed on different professions does bring with it, in certain respects, a moral judgment. Maybe moral is the wrong word, but I think one of the things that we fail to do is talk about downward social mobility if we're going to talk about social mobility and the fact that if a nursing assistant was viewed as positively as a doctor, there would be middle and upper class families that would be very happy for their children to do that job. However, it's not viewed as equivalent, partly perhaps because of the monetary value that is attached to the job, and therefore it will always be viewed by the people that already have power to get on and get ahead with the well-paid, expensive, highly valued jobs to encourage the children to make sure they don't go into it, which closes off the routes to doctorhood and places like that for those other students from working class backgrounds. Thank you very much, Ed. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Ed Dorrell um, from the TES, and just like to say thanks very much to IOE for hosting it. We're really pleased to be involved. Um, it's been great so far. Um, we're streaming this live on Facebook, and I'm having been having a quick look at some of the questions. Uh, I've been hold, having a look at some of the questions. Um, one of them comes up from one Tom Rogers who uh, may or may not be one of our columnists, I'm yet to work it out, okay. um, who asks, uh, slightly less prosaically, I think, than some of the arguments, he points out that the entire accountability system, especially Ofsted, is set up to reward those schools uh, with fewer pupil premium kids or deprived kids, which, as a second-order consequence, means uh, teachers and heads see, uh, are less keen, I suppose he points out, to go and work in those schools, what would the panel suggest we do about that? Thank you. And there was uh, just one at the back. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on the idea of geography and how that intersects with, intersects with social mobility. Um, I was particularly interested in Laura Willett's comment about um, how somebody visited a school in London and some teachers and children had a dialogue about some of the problems. Um, I worked in a school in Hartlepool. No one's ever asked my children about any of the problems they face. And so because there's less of a voice, there's often a very London-centric policy um, base. I just wondered how much of this you think is transferable outside of London um, and to what extent some of these issues um, need to be more firmly rooted in place. Thank you. And perhaps we'll try and have one more question so that I can allocate them then to members of the panel. Is there one over here? Oh, sorry, this gentleman here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, just a question about um, social immobility at the very top of the social structure. So if we were to create some spaces for social, if we were to boost social mobility, then some space is going to have to be created. What about social mobility at the top? I'm thinking here about um, social advantages, unearned advantages by elite, uh, the elites or families that um, they don't seem to generate enough opportunity for those working class and, and other families moving up the top. Thank you very much. Those are excellent questions. So um, we have the first one. a comment on recognition. Is that the one I you'd like to do? Please go ahead, Kate. <laughs> um, I, th I thought you made a really good point. And, and in our research, what we found yeah, is one. that um, a higher proportion of young people express higher aspiration in more unequal societies. And that, that worried us for a while because we weren't quite sure what it meant and then realised that those were the same societies where more children fail, um, where more children are not in employment, educational training, where they drop out of high school, where educational scores are lower. 
So it's a really sad disconnection that aspirations seem to be higher where they're less likely to be achieved. Um, and, and, and that is the impact of inequality because unequal societies make people want to have more status. They, they, it makes them want those higher incomes, that celebrity, those, those positions of status and not value all the different ways that they can contribute. So there is a real mismatch between what we, what we think we mean when we say aspirations um, and what is possible for populations and what it is we really value. I thought it was a, it was a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, James is going to take uh, accountability in Ofsted. Yeah, um, so on um, your... Um, so we've really essentially at secondary level got one measure uh, attempts to value it's flawed. Um, it's, uh, you know, and, and yes, the result is absolutely that it um, rewards the uh, schools with the higher uh, achieving cohorts, um, higher prior attainment. Um, Progress 8, uh, this is that we're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's an aggregate measure uh, that tries to take account of the attainment of all the... Uh, students in a school but um, unfortunately the, the loss is that it, it you know the design loses any sense of uh, differential effectiveness so um, which schools are being effective with different profiles of student for example um, but yeah I mean given that that's the best that we have in terms of you know uh, you know that we we don't really have uh, we don't have any contextual um, there's no there's no context allowance made for context um, in our accountability structure. Um, we we we've got a lot of challenges, um, you know, to to try to figure out, um, you know, how to identify when schools are doing, you know, at a basic level, how do we identify when schools are doing well with with in with difficult areas? As far as the regions, uh, you know, the sort of regional aspect of, uh, aspect of this goes. Um, I do think it's really, really important that we uh, are able to resource schools fairly uh, in a way that um, you know gives gives additional resources to disadvantaged uh, schools with disadvantaged cohorts, um, and uh, you know in general um, grant funding uh, because it's short term and it's sort of bunging money at, at a problem. As a framework, um, doesn't really get there. So, the pupil premium is really important to get right to incentivise providers to take on difficult areas and for them to be able to have the resources that they need to be able to address challenges. Thanks, James. David, would you be able to take the question on London and the relationship to schooling in the rest of the country? Yeah, I think my, although my example was from London, because I have a post at King's, I mean, in, in principle, it applies in exactly the same way across the whole country and should. Um, now, I don't know Hartlepool as well as I know London. The, I guess the ne universities nearest to you are Teesside um, and Sunderland, both of which are excellent universities. And if I was a local person, uh, one of the one of the many useful services they provide in the northeast is that if you want to get a job on the production line in Nissan or Honda, nowadays you probably need to do automotive engineering, and Sunderland and Teesside have got fantastic courses for that. This picture that we're also hearing of universities, it's a kind of esoteric academic route and doesn't value technical or vocational, is a very narrow view of the missions of universities. Universities are the way into many jobs in uh, manufacturing industry, and I've seen both those universities at work and I'm an admirer of them, and indeed one of the arguments in my book is absolutely we need to break free from some of the more conventional ways in which we rank universities. If I can make a one quick comment on Becky's summing up of our previous exchanges, when you said, you talked about the fiscal envelope. In terms of the the rigor of this debate, I think a way of formulating it so that we, we're clear what we're saying is 
Imagine you had X billion pounds extra to spend on education. What would you do with it? Clearly, there is not infinite resource. I fully understand the argument there should be more resource than there is. But all policy, all policy and politics is ultimately about priorities, about what you do with limited resource. And I would certainly, if someone gave me and said, yeah, I had a check for a billion or two billion or five billion, whatever you wanted on education, adult education would be one of my priorities. And a further expansion of higher education would be a priority. I think the negative propaganda around NVQs was misconceived. I, be, I believe the evidence that actually NVQs perform better than we were led to expect. But you can't just opt out of that question of relative priorities by saying we should all have more money. Whatever the budget is, let's then discuss the best way of spending it. Thank you. Well, we've got time for one more round. So, oh, oh, I'm so sorry, Diane. So I do I do apologise? Yes, immobility and downward the mobility. Topic, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think downward is definitely the elephant in the room when we talk about social mobility, and and um, I think there's very some very interesting research being done, Mike by my colleague at LSE, Sam Friedman, who's looking at the really powerful grip that a number of private schools have on the establishment, the top, you know, two, three, four, five percent of people in positions of power in the country. But I think related to that, there's some very interesting research in both the US and the UK, which shows that when working class non-traditional students, this is across ethnicity, go to elite universities, they acquire cultural capital. You know, they do well academically, but they often fail to acquire useful social capital. They're excluded from those social networks where the power and influence lies. Thank you. Right, we'll have one more round, and if we can keep the questions quick and the answers quick, we'll be able to fit it in. So, Jeff at the front, and then there's another question here. Do we have any others? Any other hands up? Oh, we have one from the live stream. If you pass it, thanks. So, starting with Jeff. Well, I actually was going to raise the question implied by uh, Diane's contribution about this report today from LSE mm. about the grip of the Clarendon Commission yeah. public schools uh, and the group beneath them. Um, I mean, on at one level. The argument could be, well, that doesn't matter because the elite jobs are uh, not the only jobs that people should value. And in the sense David has caricatured your argument, Diane, a little along those lines. Yeah. Um, but I think the question I want to ask from all or any of you is how do we tackle this extreme dominance of private schooling in this country yeah. uh, and um, you know, is it through, mm. through charity status and one of the panelists said that make it uh, illegal to go to private schools um, have the, any other members of the panel got other suggestions <laughs> uh, of how we deal with that thank you Jeff <laughs> um, there was a question just behind Um, had we had a slightly different result in the general election earlier this year, we'd been well on the way to a new wave of grammar schools, despite considerable empirical evidence they wouldn't achieve the stated aim of improving opportunities for children from a working class background. There's broad consensus amongst the panel that breaking the link between um, admissions and proximity to schools would be a good thing. But how do you expect to get middle class affluent voters to endorse that policy and vote for being able to price their way into the best schools? Thank you. Um, and we had the, the, a question from F. Jones at the 27 at the live stream um, asking for thoughts on the impact of curriculum on social mobility, um, especially high stakes subjects like GCSE English. So that's a good curriculum y one. Um, okay. Uh, did colleagues have particular questions that they would like to answer? You can go in. Um, I, I really liked Jeff's formulation. Do we care that particular professional jobs at the moment are being monopolised by uh, upper middle class young people? Presumably we all do. Um, so w would anyone and like to... And what we can do about it? Well, I think um, the reason I suggested 
what, what, what might sound to people in the mm. room like a, a very radical suggestion, because it has been, yeah. it has been tried. And I'm a great believer in, in not suggesting things that are impossible, but for looking pl at places, different places around the world where different nations, states or cities have tried different things and are managing to achieve higher levels of well-being or higher levels of education. And we do see that in Finland, you know, that radical decision was taken and, and it was part of whole system change. It wasn't the only change they made, but it was part of the whole system change they made that shot them up the rankings so that they are now at the top of educational achievement in Europe. Um, I actually was trying to look it up on the train when I was coming down here because I'm like, are there really no private schools in Finland? And there are a few. But they're funded by the state and they can't charge fees. Yeah. So I'm really struggling to figure yeah. out in what they're way private? that in what way My they're story. private. But but certainly, you know, it's it's possible to make yeah. these really radical changes right. if we want to to optimize the well being of our school children. And and I think in it refers to the question you asked about how you persuade, you know, white middle class parents that they don't want to have a sort of separate more elite education for their own children within the state sector. And we did some research on, on the white middle classes who sent their children to urban comprehensives. And there was a, a real desire to actually enable their children to mix with people who were different from themselves. And that was seen as vitally important, really important. But then there was enormous amount of anxiety and worry that they would be missing out the benefits of their white middle-class peers who were choosing a selective education. But that's why I think, you know, the, the good state tries to take some lead on these issues, as they did in Finland. You know, I think to be the good... I use Tony a lot, and he has another quote, which is, you know, the good parent should want for their all children what they want for their own child. And I think that's a really important thing to hold on to. We should want for all children a good education, not a second-rate education so we can get a first-rate education ourselves. And if that makes me a radical, well, so be it. Um, admissions, David? Yeah, and I think, I mean, Brighton got quite close to lotteries, mm, didn't it? And there was, I think, a ministerial intervention that stopped it. And I thought what we heard from James earlier was very interesting. If the, it might be that with oversubscribed schools, that was a, a viable proposition. But I, I'd like to come to the, to the kind of core issue, which is, and I want to, again, I want to keep on putting it very crudely, thinking of my own political experience in my constituency. I would have wanted more kids from the estate in Havant to go to Oxbridge and for that matter UCL. That does not mean I did not value the many other things that they did in their lives, but given that Britain is as it is today, and you can have dreams of a completely different society, but given that Britain as it is today, I would rather more kids from my estate had that opportunity. And that Now, there is a very interesting debate around the Sutton Trust concept of the missing 3,000. The missing 3,000 of the kids with good GCSEs, and I think it might be with good A-levels, I can't remember the exact details, who they say should have gone to Russell Group universities, but did not. And I fully understand, and there is a very, I fully understand the complexity of the question, whether you can simply say they're all missing. And there are certainly reasons why you could argue they're not all missing. If I were really interested in uh, wanting to make movies in Hollywood and be a film technician, going to Bournemouth is probably the best place to go. And the more information there is about the particular strengths of that university in Bournemouth a good thing. So if you may have particular preferences, which means that the Russell Group is not the be all and end all. And I also accept that if it's a university where fully participating in the social life of that university requires levels of spending which you cannot afford out of your maintenance grant on maintenance alone. If it's a social life university that assumes levels of spending that you do, your family does not have the resources to fund, that is also an issue. Well, incidentally, I do think cash pressures on 
students at university is actually a more significant issue than the graduate repayment thing. So I'm, I understand the issues, but nevertheless, anything which it just says, no, it's a wrong aspiration to have, I think, I remain, I insist, is a very bad message indeed for those kids on that estate. Thank you. And, our, and the um, curriculum question, I think, probably falls to me as the yeah, educationist yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is a real dilemma <laughs> because it comes back to some of the questions that have been coming, you know, by implication backwards and forth here about the value of um, prestigious knowledge, powerful knowledge, as, as Michael Young has it, uh, versus inclusivity and valuing all knowledge wherever we may find it. I think that we're not clear on this. Um, it's something that we, we need, um, b both on the left and the right, to be clearer about. Um, actually, you know, to be fair on the government, uh, they've absolutely sort of nailed their stakes to the EBAC and the high stakes uh, uh, knowledge curriculum, um, which there's lots of evidence to show does facilitate, you know, there's a very strong connection between those subjects access to universities, and then access to good jobs. What we don't know, of course, is whether it's all about those subjects or whether it's about the sorts of institutions that promote them. So again, the issues about social and cultural capital surrounding those. Nevertheless, I would say that there's a genuine dilemma. Every child needs access to literacy and numeracy that we know are absolutely fundamental for, their, for access to the uh, broader curriculum and to uh, you know, civic life. Um, but does that and a focus on the basics, especially for uh, kids coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, does that risk um, reducing their focus on uh, you know, the, the um, enrichment activities and so on and the nice to have classically a modern foreign language and so on that uh, many middle class kids take for granted. So there's a whole range of dilemmas here for, uh, for us as educationalists which I think are genuinely profound, require further debate um, but I think that we've made a really good start here today and it's been a real pleasure to hear from people with very different political perspectives, um, but actually very well educated and evidence-based in terms of being able to put their arguments to you. So I hope that you've all found it stimulating and a good kickoff to our series. I hope that we'll see you back and I hope you'll all join me in thanking again our panellists for an excellent and stimulating debate. <laughs>